Christopher Steak, two-time Stanley Cup champion, creator of the phenomenal Clever app, which you can download for free right now wherever you get your apps. Um, you won two cups with the Chicago Blackhawks. You, they wouldn't help you. They wouldn't let you get in. They have no juice. They didn't care about you. Your whole family, you know, your your beautiful boys, your family, you get to go down to the hockey game. Oh, oh gratis, a courtesy of the Toronto Maple Leafs. I, I, will you renounce the Chicago Blackhawks? I think I think I might renounce the Chicago Blackhawks. Thank you. You're a Leafs guy only now. Exactly. You live four, here? Well, yeah. Four Western Conference Finals over five years, two Stanley Cups. Yep. Rookie of the Year nominee. And if you were to tell me the Leafs would have been taking care of me, Mm-hmm. After my short term, pretty unsuccessful year with the Leafs, um, if it was the Leafs taking care of me, I would have told you you're absolutely out of your mind. Mm-hmm. So, Leafs alumni, I do want to give them a shout out. Yeah. Absolute incredible experience. Everyone in the box who takes care of you. My kids had an amazing time, even though they didn't, you know, I didn't even get to go down and visit with all the trainers I've had there for five plus years and Oof. all that. But, Besides that's actually that, bad. I was trying to make a joke of this, yeah. but that's that's not good. That's no. actually bad. That's a bad thing. That's that's no bueno. Wow, well, no, it, it is bad, right? Like again, I have these trainers I've been with for years, in the minors, players, guys I know, and uh, the fact that you can't you can't go see them after you know that it's it's pretty disrespectful. I will say that. Um, but again, overall incredible night incredible experience put on by the alumni and i do kind of want to touch on the depth role if you want to go through that yeah i do i I do and and i don't want to make this all about you but i just i have one other question which is most people like you know my dad was a religious boston celtics fan but then i grew up loving the seattle supersonics and he flipped immediately but my dad didn't play for the celtics you know like he didn't he didn't play for he didn't win two championships he wasn't like me and larry bird we did it (laughs) it probably would have been different in my house did your kids but, cheer for Leafs last night? Like, what was the yeah, yeah. what? Yeah. So, so your kids are on the Leafs because that's the smart yeah, they, move, by the way. Is like to have them like the local team is going to be far better for their lives. It doesn't matter if every single time they have to explain that their dad is you, and you know, by the time by the time they grow up, too, kids won't care about that at all, right? Like they'll be like, oh, it's kind of neat, but that's good. They have They're, no idea. Yeah. yeah, they have no idea. And again, if you if you ever seen my Instagram, it was like, I brought my Versteeg jerseys for my kids, and they were choked, so we had to go buy Matthews jerseys for them last night. <laughs> Actually, <laughs> choked. Like, when we pulled them out of the bag, they're like, what is this? Yeah. So we we them right off and put the, uh, put the Matthews on, because they love Matthews. They're, they also did have Bedard jerseys, and I said, not yeah. in your life will you wear a Bedard jersey, Chicago Blackhawks in the alumni box, so yeah. Out of respect to everything they yeah. did cheer for the Leafs, and they do. They love the Leafs. Yeah. No, that's great. Yeah. It's, uh, yeah. You can't go into the alumni box and be like, here's my kids decked out in full Chicago no. stuff. Yeah. Yeah. You know, like I said, he like renounces it. them. I love this. This is great. What a win for Toronto to be able to get two brand new fans, like pure yeah. Matthews guys in your sons, and then you, uh, two cups there, like you said, four Western Conference finals a rookie of the year nominee, which I wouldn't have had in your bio, but that's good. I, well, yeah. I'll put it in there. Yeah. yeah I, I noticed. Team, you know, uh, yeah. Where were you in there? Where were you in? Where were you in yeah, like how many nominees were there? Yeah. There, there must've been a lot of rookies. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, <laughs> I, was, I was like, you, you got some down ballot votes. You're like, Hey, just so yeah. you know, yeah. A couple of writers threw in some, some votes for me. Well, I, like that, that was a nice addition. That was really nice. Addition. Down here. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So the depth let's, let's get there. Let's talk about the actual team. Cause yeah, I, I don't know how much of the rant you heard before you came on, but the stars look awesome, and that's the most important thing for the Leafs, right? It, it would be – I'd be feeling worse if Domi had a couple of goals and Matthews looked like the guy from last year where we can't quite put our finger on what's going on with him. And there was already, you know, half great Nylander periods, half bad Nylander periods. But, yeah, I, I don't I, I don't know how some of these puzzle pieces are going to fit together even though there's only three games of sample size, it, it comes back to coaching. Hmm. I've looked at there again. It was hard to watch a game from the box in detail, you know, when you're up there with your kids. So I had to come back. I had to watch highlights. I had to look at ice time. I had to understand why I wasn't noticing Domi. Like the first shift actually he had it is exactly what I said he needed to do. I remember him come flying up the boards. He chipped it in. He kept it simple. They had a quick little chance. They got off. Those are things that he's going to have to do to gain the trust. But I, I looked at the ice time. Here's what I have. Chicago, two guys 
under 12 minutes, seven above 15, eight above 14 and a half. Mm -hmm. Leafs, seven guys, 12 minutes or under. Five guys, 17 minutes and over. Five guys, 14 and a half minutes and over. Five guys, 12.2 minutes and over. Everyone else is under 12. So you do not trust any of your depths to play. And I've been looking at this. It's a recurring theme from last year, the year before. I love when you got to ride your horses, no doubt. I'm a guy that mm. wants you to ride your horses, but you also need to trust your depth. You need other guys to get extended minutes, to get up in the 16-minute range. Domi needs to get there. I know Bertuzzi got there last night, but other guys need to get extended minutes. And you have to find three guys, two guys that will only play six, seven minutes. You have Reeves that might only play six, seven, three minutes maybe sometimes. But you have to get that third line, especially up in that 12 to 16 range, somewhere in the 16, maybe down up 12 minutes at night. But you need to get guys extended, trusted minutes to get them in the game. If you expect Max Domi, like I said last week, to score with 11 minutes again or Matthew Nyes with 10 and a half minutes, Mm -hmm. it's not going to happen. And you cannot trust guys to give everything in 10 and a half minutes and be offensively relied on. So that's something I I looked at right away was the ice time and understanding the difference of why maybe Chicago had energy, why maybe their depth players look better, more confident with the puck because they have more minutes. You stay in a rhythm. If you're playing 10 minutes, sometimes you might go into a, a shift. You might not play. Then you lose a rotation. Then a TV timeout comes. And then on the real time, you might not even have touched the ice for 15, 20 minutes of real time. And then you're expected to go out there and score a goal. It's just not likely. And with that type of coaching, if you're just going to lay the hammer on the top guys and not find these bottom guys extended minutes, and you're going to take that philosophy again into the playoffs, it's going to be a hard one to win with. Mm. Yeah. It's it's hard for me to blame Keith too much, though, given the personnel, right? Like... I, I, I get I it. You, you, you got to try some of these guys out yeah. and maybe Domi has to play a little bit more, but you're chasing a game and two of your centers are David camp and the 19 year old Fraser Minton. Like, I, I just you don't got, know how much you, you can lean on those guys. Around. Yeah. You got to move guys around and you got to get them out there though. Mm-hmm. You got to get them out in 25, 26 minutes is great, but you still have to get other guys in. If you're going to win a Stanley cup, that's just how it is. You have to get Domi's feeling good. You have to get Bertuzzi's. I know Bertuzzi got up in a 16 range. Uh, Whether you put Minton or Camp there to get Mm -hmm. them extended minutes, to get them in the game, there was a really bad play by Camp when he just skated right over the puck and gap gap control is bad. But maybe that's why he got less minutes as the game went on. But that's a guy maybe you just got to rely on right now since Fraser Minton can't get the job done as as a 3C getting offense. But Nice played 10 and a half minutes. It's not enough minutes for these guys to constantly create, to have the puck, to feel good about themselves. You just, you you look at all the history of time, all the teams have third lines that can get extended minutes. Mm -hmm. Maybe they don't have a lot of that personnel, but you have to try. You have to try to give them more responsibility. And if it doesn't work, then obviously you have to go out and make a change. You have to trade. You have to do what you need. We already know they need a three C, a true three C, but they need to start relying on other guys to try to create more, to try to give them more depth. And if you go with this type of, oh, let's just rely on the top guys to score, bottom guys, then you get in the playoffs again, and all of a sudden your bottom guys aren't scoring, and you're not really, you haven't really taught them anything, and then maybe you need them at some point, and then they can't handle it, that's also what you start to run into. So they just need to figure out how they're going to get more extended minutes throughout their lineup. Like, is Boris Kachuk that much better than Domi? He played 15, right? Yeah. I know, and you look at it, the rest of their lineup, eight guys, eight guys above, I think it was, again, what did I say, 14 or 15 mm-hmm. minutes? That's what you need to figure out what you can do. Like, again, find Matthews' time, find Marner his time, and Nylander, especially with Nylander's looking like this, but get other guys on the ice. Yeah, again, they're chasing it, and so there's a little bit of fudging with the numbers, especially the the later portions of the game. But yeah, I think that if you're chasing it, you can't have Domi playing 1137. Um, I get some of the other guys, but man, Kampf, Kampf is getting paid two and a half sheets. And they brought him back to be the third line center. Then he kind of ends up getting bumped down to the fourth line center because it doesn't really fit. And the, the more I, I think about this offseason for Trey Living and the Leafs, felt like they lost Ryan O'Reilly and they didn't want to lose two centers. And so they kind of hit a little bit of the panic button with camp and just said, no, 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 come back, come back. 
But with this current roster, he doesn't make a ton of sense. And again, maybe after the deadline, maybe at a different point this season, he does. He's probably a guy who was always destined to be someone where we question the regular season stuff and then we get in the playoffs and he's shutting someone down or he's giving you some some really great defensive zone draws and you're saying, oh, no, 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 this this makes sense now. Now he's making his money. But yeah, that I just, I don't know what you're supposed to do there. And like for a team that coming into the season, people acknowledge the puzzle pieces didn't fit, but they would get secondary scoring from some of these guys to not really see any of that from Nyes, to not really see any of that from Domi. I, I think that's kind of been the tough part so far is that the bottom six, maybe it's not enough opportunity, but it also hasn't felt like when they've gotten them that they've they've given enough push or that they're providing any kind of a spark. Yeah, I just go back to the minutes. I'm looking at them again. You look at them over the three games. It's just not enough opportunity at all. And if I was in that situation and I was expected to score with seven, eight, ten, like Champ played nine, nineteen, and I'm not at two and a half million. If he's your three C, love Fraser Minton and all, and, and you know he's doing his best. Mm-hmm. But you got to elevate him to the three C. Find him. See, maybe he can take an offensive zone draw. He was seventy-seven percent on the draws last night. Mm-hmm. Maybe he can take an ozone draw, win it back on the third line. Uh, and maybe give Domi a, a chance off a draw or give Nice a chance off mm-hmm. a draw. So those are, those are things. It's just not enough opportunity to me. You, mm-hmm. you just, it's just too hard to create. If you're not, if you're an offensive guy and you need to have a little bit of ability to paint outside the lines, like I talked with last week, you don't get the same rope as a Matthews or a Marner, but at 11, 10, eight, minutes it's impossible to cut to constantly create and do what you need to do you know what i wonder too and this is just right now and again i people are gonna get mad at me for this because they're gonna say oh this is a reach but if i was tree living and you brought me in and i'm making these signings right a bunch of these like i've paid these guys i'm the one who brought in domi i'm the one who gave camp that contract extension so on and so forth right and then all of a sudden the, the coach that i said we're on the same page is not playing any of my guys Right. I wonder if that, if that's like, Hmm, you know, it happened in the past too. Yeah. It's uh, Clifford in the one playoffs. I, we've, we battled about that a bit, yeah. but you did need his physicality. I know he took the dumb penalty. Yeah, he's but, almost killed him, but yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but, <laughs> like, he, you know, that's up, that's a played great. And you, you pigeonhole him at this minute, you uh-huh. pigeonhole him at the 10, 11 minute. This is what happens when Keith gets into these scenarios he doesn't elevate guys in offensive roles to give more push and help from the back. So your, your bottom six is really, they really have no chance if they're not going to push like with our Chicago Blackhawks with the, you know, we had lad and, and Bowen and myself, some nights we'd play 15, some nights we'd play 20, depending on who we were checking and depending on how much PK or PP we would get. And generally we were second PP PK. So that's a third line, and you're still finding hosts and those guys to get on, and you're still finding Kane and Taze. And it's similar for this. you got to find the minutes for your bottom guys to feel good about themselves. And it, look in the past. You can hear my cat. I don't know what he's doing. I was going to say, um, yeah, that cat yeah. is hungry. Feed that cat for the love of God. He's not. I gotta move rooms here, but he uh, he's nuts. But he uh, but but that's that's what you got to do in order to find elevated roles and and help these guys do what they need to do yeah. uh, on the offensive side of the puck. And it's just it's just not possible at that time. And I, again, you go back through the history of Keith. This is the exact same thing that's happened in the past. Yeah, that that's fair given the context of it. Because you're right, this is something that he's employed in the past. I would just say, if we're drawing the the comparisons, your Blackhawks team had a lot better depth than what these guys are. And so I, I guess I'm just a little torn between how much of this is a guy should earn the ice time. A guy should show something before you're just throwing them out there for those offensive opportunities when you're behind in a game versus how much a coach just needs to kind of change the way he operates a little bit and think about the long term versus the the short term of trying to win one game against the Blackhawks in game three of the season. But you know, that, that brings all that encompassing. Yeah. Yeah. Really? It, it's it really has to be. be all that. It, it does, yeah. but it brings me to the, the main thing, which is, so every time I look at it, I go, how do I make the pieces fit? How do I make the pieces fit? How do I make the pieces fit? And, and I'm usually a believer of, hey, if a guy's going, don't mess with anything he's doing. Like, don't change his role. Don't change his minutes. In fact, just give him more, 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 more. 
But Nylander looks so good this year. He looks so strong this year. And he's clearly driving that line, right? With him and Tavares, oh, yeah. it's just, it's, it's not a question as to who is doing what. Nyes is not going whatsoever. Like he is just, he's, he's lost with Fraser Minton. I wonder if the eventual move here, if we're talking about the long term, the short term, getting guys more involved, whatever, adding to your depth, finding out what actually matters in the season is to go back to the Nylander at center question because we did it all off season. They talked about it. It was very clear that they kind of needed to do it based on the depth that they had at the position. And then Fraser Minton came into camp and got all these positive storylines and it was, Oh, he's so mature and he's great. And maybe he could actually break camp with the team. But now we're seeing like the pressures of being a 19 year old kid. Who's got to be the third center on a team with Stanley cup expectations. It's just like, it's not a, it's not a, it's not a long-term plan. It's not something that they can bank on right now. And so to me, I, I look at it and go, why not put, why not put Tavares with his own line, give him nice, give him a different, and then put together a third line. That is Domi on a wing with Nylander and yarn and just see how that operates. Yeah. You're going to really have to be specialized matchups because depending on how much Willie wants to play in the D zone, and how much responsibility he's going to want to take in the D zone. Can he do it? 1,000%. His skating ability, his hockey IQ, but it's his determination to defend in day in and day out as a centerman. Mm. You can maybe do it here and there for a game or two if you're trying to, you know, band-aid some position or someone gets hurt or something happens or you're trying to go for it offensively. I just question I do. Yeah, I agree. I just question the day in day out determination to play center. I I would go back between wing and center and I would play center for about a week and a half. And I remember I'd start to cheat for offense all of a sudden about a week and a half in because you're not getting as much chances. I wasn't a great skater, especially Mm -hmm. like a a Nylander, but he could still create more than obviously I would, but you start to cheat and rather than defend to get your offense, you start to cheat on offense. And if you cheat on offense as a centerman at all, you're going to get exposed in this Mm -hmm. league big time. So I just wonder the day in day out grind mentality that you actually need as a centerman to defend. If he would be willing to do that. He is, like you said, in such a great place right now. He's feeling it. He's Mm -hmm. going for it. Even on that goal, like he's swinging across the neutral zone, turning around, picks it up one hand, cuts across, makes a drop pass. That was wild. Gorgeous. Absolutely wild. Like the plays he are making, he's making is plays only a like a handful of people on the planet can do, and especially at that speed and thinking and processing the game, it, it's it's magic essentially. So I just don't know if you mess with it. I, I don't mind trying it within the game, offensive situations. Okay, we're in the O zone. Nylander hasn't been on a couple shifts. Fraser Minton isn't going. Let's get mm-hmm. Nyes and Domi going in the O zone. Hundred percent. Plot them in. Make sure you tell. Nyes and Domi listen we don't know if Willie's coming back on this shift that would happen with Kane at times or you know it'd be like okay he might not come back so Chris you got to back check maybe prep those guys for those scenarios that hey he's coming on an offensive zone draws Fraser Mittens out or camps out those are things that you could do I would just worry about the day in day out grind again I don't I don't I don't think it's a problem but I think you got to start to slot it in dude more on the offensive side and then go from there no it's a it's a great point and, and everything you're saying is right. I'm saying that you don't have an ideal situation. Like if it was obvious yeah. to put Nylander there, they would have done it already. They would have said, yeah, yeah, no, he, we don't feel like he's going to cheat. We don't feel like he's going to do any of those things. We don't think it's going to, you know, you and I talked last year when they took him off power play one, how frustrating that was for Nylander. And people have said, well, if you put him at center, he can earn all this money. And it's an incentive to say, if he does this well, it's like, I think he'd be fine pointing to -to back-to-back 40 goal seasons, which he can do comfortably in this top six winger role and say, yeah, I'm going to get paid. Like if I I keep playing the way that I'm playing through the first three games of the season, I'm pretty sure someone's going to show up at my door on free agency day with the, the bag of money that I so desire. Right. Like, I I don't think that the center stuff is going to incentivize him outside of if he's the kind of guy who's geared towards that challenge right now. Like if mentally they go, don't you want to see what your maximum potential is as a player? The other option is to simply complete his point totals too. Yeah, but but that's that's exactly what you said. So dude, that's why you can't, that he's not going to want to do it. He's like, why would I want to lose points in a contract season? Why would I want to be criticized for the defensive mistakes that I make? Why would I want to be shown on every single article or every single tweet when I do try to cheat for my offense because there's a million eyes watching this and I'm going to end up getting the the circle treatment, right? Where, Oh, look at this on the, on the telestrator where it's like, here's the William Nylander trying to fly the zone. 
Like if I'm him, I understand why I don't want it. And that's why, but it's just like, I think, I think it's the only choice you have outside of the other one is you try Domi as your three C and you go with an offensive line there, but it's clear tree living doesn't trust him on the wing. So I don't think that he's going to trust yeah. him in that role. Like he ain't putting him at center. That's right what now. I mean. There's I no just, chance. I don't know what it, the hell you do. It, so back in 2000, I know I'm talking back and I'm one of those old retired. Yeah, you guys. Are, you, yeah, yeah. No wonder your kids groaned when you pulled the jerseys out. They're like, Oh, this again, yeah. we get it. You played God. Yeah. <laughs> Patrick Sharp, an offensive winger could play center in 2010. Quenville went to him and basically said, this is your role. Please play center. We don't have anyone with your ability to move to the center hole and the two C. Mm -hmm. So they actually moved sharp in to the two C. It depleted his points. His point production went down due to that, but it helped obviously elevate us to win without him in the two C and taking that role on, we don't win. So you go back to the entire scenario, the situation, can Willie do it? Mm -hmm. thousand percent it's a dedication you have to make day in and day out to be a a top 2c playing against guys grinding it defensively how much do you want to win Mm -hmm. that's the second piece how much are you willing to sacrifice you got to sacrifice to win guys got to sacrifice points they got to sacrifice their bodies that's just it's a similar scenario super offensive winger great speed willie's even higher end but that's something that if you're looking to win a stanley cup Mm-hmm. That could be a piece that you do. It's just, it, it's, it is a funny year. It's a contract yep. year. He also had contract security, different, but, it, and he's going to get paid regardless of yes. how it goes. But that's a piece that, how much are you willing to do? What are you willing to sacrifice? And I'm not saying he has to, but it's just, it is an interesting conversation. You know, it's crazy. I hate saying this, but I, and I, I think everyone outside of the most, Die hard William Nylander fans, the ones that have his his profile on their or their his picture on their social media. I think we'd all say normally what you're saying is, hey, this is another reason to give this guy the contract right now, right? Hey, he's earned it. Prove to him that he's a part of the organization. Give him that little bit of extra money so that he has the buy in to feel like, hey, I don't have to. Sa- I can sacrifice the points because I'm here long term, and he gave me everything I wanted. But he's the type of guy where I say you remove the incentive and it it potentially creates another question mark. Like, I'm not 100% on that being the case. I'm sorry. I, I just I'm not. Yeah. Does that com- create complacency? Is what yeah. You're like, I, I don't want to have that either. I, I love yeah. <laughs> like I, I hate like that. He's, he's motivated. He's great. Yes. I think that they have no choice right now, but to give him the contract extension. I just I don't see a scenario that makes sense for them whatsoever anymore especially now that Matthews is under the four-year deal, like the time to trade Nylander or Marner has passed to me. Like maybe it resurfaces with Marner at some point. If they really need to shake it up, they have another disappointment and whatever. I I don't know, but I I just don't, I don't see how this works in season, Uh, like recouping assets. They'd have to be out of the playoff picture. And even then it would feel like such a disappointment. I don't know what the, it's like, everybody's got to go essentially. Like everybody's got to, it's clean house. You got to be fired. I don't know. You, it's just bad. It's so, so, so bad doomsday scenario. But yeah, I just, I think eventually they're going to have to take a look at it and maybe it comes later in the year, but I want to have that information at least so that if it does come to this in the postseason, you have something else, another move to go to so that you just don't see a repeat of years past or you don't have situations where guys that don't belong. Um, yeah. Are, are playing in and roles you, that they, you, they, they shouldn't be in see that though. Put him in the offensive zone. Start to try it in the ozone. Start to see how he tracks back if they lose the face-off. Start to see, you know, you're going to get a lot of, like, data essentially on what you need from him and what he's doing. Mm -hmm. And you can protect him in that that piece and that role by also uh, getting his wingers information. So, yeah, Yeah. there is things they can do. It's just, are they willing to do it? Or are they just going to keep stuffing three guys out there for 25 minutes and yeah. hoping they win on the Stanley Cup? Yeah. I don't know. No. And, and I, well, here's what I would say if you're a Leaf fan listening to this and you're like, no, no, no. Is, what do you think is going to be more important this year? Getting information on whether Fraser Minton can play center at 19 this week? Like, they, they play the Panthers on Thursday and they play the Lightning on Saturday. What do you think is a more important data set to have if you're Sheldon Keefe? Minton versus those teams at 3C playing 11 minutes or Nylander playing 16, 17 down the middle against those guys? I think it's pretty clear which one it is. Oh, it's Nylander, but I think you yeah. can do the combo again. Sure. Play him on the wing. 
play him in situations at center, mm-hmm. see him, see him, you know, process the game going from wing to center. Cause it is a, diff- it is a difficult thing and not everyone can go wing to center. Yeah. That's what wing. I mean. I feel like that's a but, lot to put on somebody's plate in one game. Yeah. But you could start to test the scenario, see mm-hmm. how he's doing, see how he's attacking, see how, see where he's going again. Is he tracking back as a centerman getting back into the zone? What is he doing? Obviously you can't take as much risk in the ozone consistently. And it just if that happens, then that's great. But that's stuff that you got to be willing to do, and stuff you got to be willing to talk about, and decisions you got to be willing to make. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know if they're going to do it. <laughs> no, I don't think I don't think they're going to do it either. I, I it just it just to me is uh, again I'll, last thing I'll say is I want to I want to see it, and, and I keep thinking like when you're saying can he do it a hundred percent? I I I know he can. Because uh, like that play he made yesterday with his own entry, and I know it's easier where it's off the wing, but the way that he's seeing the ice right now, the way that he's skating, just you know, you mentioned there's only a couple of guys in the league that can do the stuff he's doing. I, I I wonder how many guys do you think there are in the league right now that have his lower body strength? Oh man, I mean, you, you talk about McKinnon, but he's more of an ox, and. and... Willie's but that's what I'm saying. A, he's he's, he's in the conversation painter. with like the top of the top top yeah. guys. Yeah. Well, and it, it's his, it's just how smooth he is on his edges. That's another thing. McKinnon's not smooth. He's just a horse. He flies up and down. He's more powerful. Mm-hmm. It's it almost McDavid in, in a sense, obviously not the top speed, but just that uh, perfect fluidity of how they bend their knees and how they, they cut across the ice and, and they pick up speed and they never look like they're getting tired. It, it really is an art. And, you know, you always talk about guys who essentially have been, touched by God, obviously his skating and his ability to maintain mm-hmm. speed and, and to not get tired essentially because of how efficient he is, is up there with, with McDavid's. Why, why do you see McDavid play four or five minutes in an overtime and mm-hmm. not come on? Like these, it, if I went out for 30 seconds, you'd have to put a rope out there and drag mm-hmm. me off. These guys are just so proficient and so efficient at what they do and and how they do it, and it's it's unbelievable to watch. Like you said, he caught that puck in speed, turns around, cuts across, and he's still picking up speed where he barely was even crossing over. Mm-hmm. So there's there's multiple guys in the league that can do it. Some do it maybe a bit better, or some do it better, like Connor McDavid, mm-hmm. but he's up there with the best. Yeah, I saw Bedard do it a little bit last night too, well, not to that next. extent, but I, I actually think Bedard is like everyone tries to find these comparisons for him. And I'm like. You know, even last night on Leafs Talk, Cuthbert and I were talking about how, you know, there's there's some Kucherov to him. There's some Matthews with the shot because he tried to steal that from him. But the the thing that I see that's the most, oh, no, that's the obvious thing is when he's playing on the rush, he has the McDavid ability to go super fast, but the yeah. stick looks slow. Like the thought process is he's getting tight to the net. It doesn't feel rushed. It doesn't, it, it just, this guy's cool, calm, collected as he's going you know, 40 kilometers an hour blown by a defender. And and that's what I see is just like mini McDavid. Yeah, he's he's incredible. He processes the game again, super fast, his mm-hmm. edge work, um, everything he does uh, around the ice, he's always processing and making generally, you know, his his passing rate. I mean, how many times do you really see him turn it over? No, it do he's so he's so much incredible. smaller than a lot of these guys. Mm-hmm. And yet the way yeah, he's able to use his body and protect the puck and then make just these He's a thick kid too, right? Yeah, he's just he sure, but I like the short little quick passes that he's able to make in the offensive zone must be so frustrating for some guys where they look at him and they they get in tight and they're thinking, "Oh no, don't worry, I'll be able to take the puck from this kid." It's like, "No, he just he makes I love watching him because it just seems like he makes the right play every time." He's a he's a ninety five five guy. So everyone used to ask me the difference between Kane and Gaudreau, especially when I first got with Johnny. And I was like, Johnny's about a seventy five, you know, twenty five guy. He makes his plays seventy five percent of the time, you know, and he it's it's high risk and turnover consistently. Kane makes it ninety five percent of the time. When Kane turns it over, and he's making high end, high IQ, hard plays consistently. Bedard's in that 95-5 category. He's putting behind the back passes that normally would get picked off. He's making them. He's throwing cross seam passes that normally get tipped. He's making them. It's pretty impressive to see a kid at that age be able to make those plays at that high of a rate and connect all those passes and again get his shots on that. I don't know how many he had last night, but he had a post four. and yeah, four a four plus a post. 
his dad's going to have a heart attack, by the way. That's a yeah. whole other thing. Yeah, he's... But, um, <laughs> oh, my God, he's going yeah. to gonna need to just take a week off and go to a spa, his yeah. dad. Yeah. And I'm not kidding. Like a full week off, don't watch hockey. Yeah. Go to the spa, get your feet rubbed, and <laughs> just do not watch hockey. So yeah. I, feel, I feel stressed watching him. Yeah. But it was a his lot. Kid is, his kid is just otherworldly. Yeah. They're incredible. Yeah. You almost want to tell him, like, no, man, your kid's good. It's fine. Yeah, he made the league. <laughs> yeah. Don't. Hey. Hey. He's he's really good. It's it's all right. You know. It's it's okay if if the goalie saves him once in a while. It's going to be all right. He's going to score a lot of goals in the league. He's going to have a pretty healthy future in the yeah, NHL. It is stressful, right? Yeah. They're in a they're in a media circus right sure. now. And well, that's where I'm going next. Gone. Well, but, okay. It, the, the practical part of it is actually. I thought last night Taylor Hall, like if. If Bedard had a different winger who was making more of the 95 plays than the 75-25s, I think he scores because there was a couple of spots where I thought Taylor Hall just missed him. One off the rush that I, I thought was flat out brutal. Um, or and that, coming around the net twice in the first, he could have had him coming down and yeah. he didn't get it and he gave it to the D. There yeah. was a couple times like that. Yeah, yeah just I, I don't know what – personally, my conspiracy theory is that Taylor Hall is jealous. He's like – I never got this hype, and then when I did, I wanted out, and yeah, anyway. He's a little professional jealousy. He's, he, well, he's talking before the game started. I don't know. I know. That. I'm just joking around. I don't really think that's true, but maybe just a touch of it, you know, like a little touch of no, it. We're all jealous a bit. I'm yeah, that's jealous. what I mean. Isn't it, is it all right for Taylor Hall? I got traded off the Bruins to go to a rebuild, and it's a former first overall pick. He's like, you're not so hot. I was pretty good, too. Yeah, I just wonder. I just wonder. He's a competitive guy. So anyway, um, before the game, he says that he thinks Bedard is doing too much media and he needs to do less. And I'm a media guy, so I go, dude, shut up. Bedard is one of the most important things, one of the most important guys to the NHL right now. They're trying to market south of the border. They just had him opening night against the Penguins. They just had him against the Habs, the Bruins, the Leafs, right? This is, this is going to be, hey, here's the league's new toy. These guys always want more money they want the salary cap to go up but then you know he's talking about how he doesn't want any of the one of the league's most famous players a guy with legitimate buzz right now to be in front of any cameras or less cameras which i despise but then i think about it practically in terms of him looking out for a 19 year old kid who is doing a lot and who is also having to play close to 20 minutes a night for this team down the middle like where where are you at with hall speaking out about what uh bedard has had to do to start the season from a yeah media off ice standpoint yeah, looking at him on a human level, you always want to make sure he's okay and he's not overwhelmed. It doesn't mm. seem like he is. From a league level, you need more. Yeah, I, I, I need agree. Bedard. I said I need McDavid downtown, Calvin Klein, mm -hmm. Madison Square, you yeah. know, or wherever. You need to promote these guys as much as possible. These guys are what's going to sell the sport for the next 15 years. These are the guys that you know bring people out of their seats every single night. You need more attention, not so much maybe buzz around the uh, like or, or more sound bites from him, but just more highlights, more of him shooting in warm up. Wow, look at him shoot it in warm up. I mean, is he just shooting a puck in warm up? Yeah, but people are enamored with him shooting a puck in warm up. These are things that is selling him. It's selling the game, and it's what we need. It's what I, I've said. What was it? How long ago was I on with McDavid when I was rattled that he's still on at ten thirty at night? It's an mm -hmm. absolute travesty of the league, and it's still brutal that they're not doing six p.m. starts in Edmonton. It's disgusting, but we don't need to go there. But these guys need to be hyped. They're some of the best athletes on planet Earth, and our sport needs to keep growing. Like you said, the cap, the cap needs to keep going up. These guys got to earn what they're worth, and this is a piece of it. So I, I agree what he's doing on a human level, looking out for him maybe, or just trying to temper expectation. But as a media level, I, I love it. I, you know, you see my, my own kids come on, and they look at him taking a shot and warm up, like mm -hmm. I said, like a little quick clip and, and stuff like that. The, the fans love it and give it to them. Yeah, I, I think they need to because part of the my whole argument of Bedard needs to be in Chicago was that people were going to see him, but that also he was going to be in a market that mattered. Like um, I was talking to Colby yesterday. Harper and he, right now. Bryce Harper, just go there a second before yeah. you talk about Colby. Everything is about Bryce Harper yeah. right now. Yeah, and the way the sound bites he's giving and the, the emotion he's talking, it's the best. Oh, it's so I good. don't even like baseball. 
I love it, and so I double uh, love I it. Know you yeah. love it? Yeah. Okay, and I'll go to Colby. But that they sell yeah. him every second he's on the screen. Right? Dude, they no. should. They should. This is this is anyway. It's it's. I get it that if you put yourself out there, there's risk of looking like a fool if it goes wrong. But yeah, I just think the upside is massive. Like, and we all accept that Bryce Harper is a bit of a douche. Like he is. He's just a douchey guy, and he has been from the moment he stepped in the league like he's he had a one up here where people asked him if he's gonna celebrate his birthday remember that and they said hey you're gonna go out for a drink on your birthday and he's just looks at the reporter here and he says it's a clown question bro i went "Ugh, <laughs> this guy makes me sick he gives me the heebie-jeebies but when i watch him you know stare down guys rounding the bases as he's pimping two home runs or celebrating his 31st birthday as he's trotting around the bases where he's talking trash at podiums, I can't get enough. And it makes me want to watch this guy resonate with that city. And so hopefully, I think I I was going to actually tell Colby yesterday that I sort of blame Sidney Crosby just a touch because it's like Mm -hmm. the LeBron thing in basketball where I blame LeBron for some of the player movement because guys, they wanted to emulate LeBron, right? Everybody says they emulate Kobe. And I don't see enough of that in basketball where guys are just killer mentality. I I see a lot of guys who actually say they want to be Kobe, but then they really emulate a lot of LeBron with like the business, the championship, like the ring chasing, the switching teams, all that stuff. And I think one of the, and it's not, it wasn't just Sid that did this, but I think one of the things that to me will be part of Crosby's legacy is, yeah, it seems like a great guy. seems like a nice guy, but the way he handled everything with the approach of just cool, calm, collected, never let him see you do anything other than when PK got him for a second in the Stanley cup finals where Sid got pissed for like a microsecond. I, Bedard seems to have soaked that up of like, and that McDavid has done the same thing, even though McDavid actually says stuff sometimes, but the professionalism he's approach. A, he's also got an Instagram and a social handle, which yeah. even just pictures, uh, like something half yeah. plus followers. Yeah. Like Sid, yeah. Sid doesn't have to even run the account. Just post yeah. pictures of scoring <laughs> yeah, goals in the game. And he, you know, yeah, I know. But that, that's something when we were it, just to defend Sid a little bit on this, when social media came out, our, our era was the lab rats for social media, mm. our era. So we didn't even know what it was 2007, 8, 9, 10, when Twitter and Instagram and everything was coming out. They told us at get rid of not it. go on, yeah. to get rid of it. Yeah. While the other leagues started to realize how to use it. Um, so it, it was basically, it, it was, we're the lab rats essentially, yeah. and the, the NHL scared players away from it. Yeah. And it's kind of hurting them now. A little bit, and now these players, these younger players, again, even Connor Bedard doesn't do much on it, but he posts goals or he posts thank yous, and he's got a half million followers. He has, yeah. some, he has some commercials to post on there. It's big for him. It's big for his brand. But to defend Sid and to defend all the players, you know, in those days we were literally, literally told, you know, get rid of it. Yeah, and you wonder why because you guys would come up with handles like Stegalicious, for example. Uh, yeah. And you would run that out there and say, this is fine. I'm sure this will be all right. And then, yeah, follow that account, yeah. by the way. It's there. No, no. But I, again, I never, <laughs> I never had a public account. Yeah. In, not even until, like, yeah. I think I was retired for a year and a half. Yeah. The first time. Yeah. I so, remember so, when we first tried yeah. to go promote your Twitter. I think you had a page for a hot second when you were in Florida and you, you just disappeared. Yeah. Yeah. No, it was, I never had any. Yeah. Never. Oh, that someone made that for you, eh? Oh, oh. They're, I got a, yeah, they're fake. Oh, but, the fans. Uh, the fans, yeah, they just wanted, my, they wanted you my, there. They my want, 10 fans. Yeah, they, want, they wanted to pretend they were you. It was, certainly wasn't your kids. <laughs> it yeah. wasn't them. Yeah. Uh, yeah. All right, buddy. We got yeah. to run here. Um, again, uh, creator of the Clever app, which, yes, you're coaching sports. You're involved in youth sport, any level of sport. I would recommend that you download, you go check out the app. Again, it's free there. And again, you can follow at Stegalicious and just shoot him a DM anytime. He's always available to you. And he will always reply immediately. He'll drop everything he's doing, and he'll make sure that he can run you through the entire app. Uh, Christopher Stieg, two-time Stanley Cup champion. By the way, you were a third in Calder voting in 09. I told you. Yeah, I know. Yeah, Steve Mason won. Oh, actually, who, who was second? Uh, uh, Bobby Ryan. Yeah, correct. Yeah, see. And, oh, and uh, Christopher Stieg. And then uh, yeah. you ask uh, Steven Stamkos, who was on his wing yeah. for the uh, all-rookie team. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, he's probably yeah. circled it as one of the highlights of his career. <laughs> so, and probably when he goes into the hall, you think you'd be yeah. where, where do you think you'd be sitting front and center, front left? You know, you'll well, be, like, yeah. be like, How did Patrick Berglund and Christopher yeah. Steve make the all rookie yeah. team over me? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's probably more likely. Thanks for coming on, buddy. Talk to yeah. you soon. All right, later. See you, pal.